Uh, okay, my, uh, my um, presentation will benefit a lot from what's come before it. Uh, voices of protest. Remembering Ambedkar and his thoughts. One cannot remember Ambedkar without also remembering caste and untouchability and his uh, struggles against both forms of oppression. For a person like myself, that uh, means quite a strain on my memory. Um, having been away from India for over a century, my memory is a little bit shaky. <laughs> One other thought about remembering and, remember and remembering on Ambedkar's birthday that crossed my mind had to do with how would Ambedkar have remembered untouchability as a Buddhist, as someone who had converted? The tragedy, as I see it, and the word has come up before, the tragedy for him and us is that he only lived, I believe it's six weeks, as a non-Hindu. That voice, that voice of a convert speaking about untouchability, he did not leave us as a model. He left us many other things, many other puzzles and questions. But that example, he did not leave us. And there's a tragedy also, I feel, in um, reading about his life. He's someone I really only came to know relatively recently. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the tragedy, that, he, that after so much of struggle and having had this idea for such a long time, he only really lived it for six weeks. I wonder what those six weeks were like. This presentation of my thoughts on voices, protest, and stigma, which is something that I've been thinking about for a while, as they've come up in my attempt to understand caste as a pervasive and ongoing system of oppression in India, it is caste, it is thinking about Ambedkar and thinking about caste that has compelled me to confront these issues of voice, protest, and stigma in the way that I um, will attempt to present to you. But however, being uh, you know, a recent returnee to this uh, subject, I need to keep myself grounded in something I know, in, 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 what, in something I'm, I have some familiarity with. So I'm not going to speak about voice protest and stigma, um, especially voice and protest in an abstract way, but I'm, I, I would like to reflect on uh, voice and protest within the academia, within academia, within what we do. So it is not, also it's not about with regards to who gets hired or why universities can't fill reserved posts, etc. But rather I'm interested in exploring whether the default academic genre, the scholarly article, is the most appropriate form for addressing this issue in a caste-ridden society. So the question of new forms is something that I am concerned with um, exploring. Whether, and what I am concerned about as a teacher as well, is whether or not we are introducing too early to our students this particular form. It's a question I'd like to put to us as teachers. And whether or not there is a form a form of scholarly engagement, engaging with ideas that might be more appropriate to undergraduate students, one that will allow them the opportunity to find their voice. 
because it seems to me that we are in need of many different voices. For example, the voice that Ambedkar did not leave with us. And I wouldn't get too much into it, uh, because I would like to end this with a little demonstration of what I mean. And this, this, this essay is actually an attempt to demonstrate that, an attempt to find some other voice. It's an attempt for me to find my voice in this particular debate. So I am actually thinking about the emphasis on the scholarly article. It's not about whether or not the scholarly article is something that should be rejected or not. I am thinking about at that moment when one finds one's voice. So I'm in a way making a, to kind of get on with the subject, I'm making a, a, a kind of plea for the conscious return to the essay form, which we might confuse with the scholarly article at times. The essay form, as I understand it, and as genre studies scholars have described it, is a much more loose, amorphous form than the scholarly article. It is not as exclusive as the scholarly article is. I am making a plea for what has been described as that puzzling and exasperatingly hybrid and amorphous literary form. As one genre studies scholar has noted, I don't know if I, how much time I will have. You have five minutes. Uh, I've got five minutes. No, no, to go. you have taken five minutes. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, because I haven't really gotten through my first paragraph, <laughs> which is a short one. Um, yeah, as one, one scholar has noted, if one is willing to grant that the essay is indeed a distinctive form or genre, then it instantly partakes of the notorious difficulties involved in all genre studies. The most serious of these has been, been, point, been, been pointed by yet another scholar in the form of the following quandary. How can I identify tragedy or any other genre before I know on which works to base the definition? Yet, how can I know on which works to base the definition before I have defined tragedy? But more on the essay in a bit. What do I know about caste? Have been, been away from the horrors associated with the practice of caste in India for over a century, away in body at least, the question of what I, what, do, what I do know about caste has been a recurring one for me, at least recently. I have several colleagues here who are much more qualified to speak on this subject than I am. However, we are here to generate a discussion and possibly my distance from this subject is what can add to generating this discussion. You're probably more interested, it's probably more interesting for you, my confusions, than your own confusions. I recently participated in a workshop on, titled Cultures of Vi Violence, in which one of my central concerns as a historian centered on the relationship between stigma and the past. Whether or not to overcome stigma necessitated a foregoing a letting go, if not a forgetting of the past. Contained in some way in the idea of let bygones be bygones. But when those bygones relate to labor, I get doubly concerned. You see, my historical education began with lyrics such as, if you know your history, then you would know where you're coming from then you wouldn't have to ask me, who the hell do I think I am? It comes out of the streets and in a political culture which said, which emphasized the fact that freedom is not something that's given, it's something that's taken. So any suggestion of the possibility of erasing the past con concerns me 
both intellectually as a student of history, a social scientist, and also politically as someone in solidarity with the larger struggle for a better world. If to overcome the oppressive power of stigma means, in some way, a denial of the past, then in my mind, we must revisit our understanding of stigma. And here, drawing from my experience of the Rastafari movement born in Jamaica and the Caribbean, in that earlier paper on caste and violence, outlined in that earlier pap paper on caste and violence, I hope to convincingly argue that stigma is actually a source of strength rather than a marker of shame. Like I said, this draws on the analysis, practice, and history of the Rastafari. Briefly, the, Rastaf the Rasta in the Caribbean converted every negative quality attributed to them. Laziness, being unintelligent, being ganja smoking, music loving, dreadlocks wearing, etc. into a potent critique of the very system that deemed them to be lazy, etc., etc. That system that they called the Babylon system. They evolved their own language in which to talk about their place in society. That system that attempted to make scapegoats out of them. The Rasta offered us the goats analysis of scapegoating concluding with respect to education, for example, the Rasta did, that if I was ed educated, referring of course to educate education provided by Babylon, if I was educated, I'd be a damn fool. In some of the lyrics that formed my early education, some of them go like this, and I think it relates to what I've been reading and my understanding of caste. I and I build a cabin, and I and I plant the corn. Did my people before me slave for this country? Now you look me with that scorn, and you eat up all my corn. We're going to chase them crazy. We built your penitentiaries. We built your schools. Brainwash education to make us the fools. Hatred you reward for our love. Telling us about your God above. We're gonna chase them crazy. Recently, Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe infuriated Jamaican men by labeling them chronic drunkards and unambitious potheads. He claimed that they had no interest in higher education and were always high. <laughs> During his controversial speech at the University of Zimbabwe in Harare, those men want to sing, sing and do not go to college. They don't go to colleges. Some of them are dreadlocked, he said, but let's not go there. We have to remember that in April of 1998, Bob Marley and the Whalers performed in Zimbabwe at Zimbabwe's official independence ceremony at the invitation of the country's newly elected president, Robert Mugabe. <laughs> the song that Bob Marley wrote specifically for that was the song, Zimbabwe. And the open lines, opening lines of that song are, every man got a right to decide his own destiny. And in this judgment, there is no partiality. So arm in arms with charm, 
We'll fight this little struggle Cause that's the only way we will overcome a little trouble Colonialism, slavery, it's a little trouble And we have to deal with it What we learn from the Rastafari is that to be the target of a stigma means that you pose a clear and present danger to the existing social order. Every trait that is condemned in the stigmatized, if allowed to flourish, would bring down the entire system. One has to judge one's strength by the force of the weapon deployed against you. The stigma, for, for obvious reasons, does everything but physically kill. The implications for dignity and self-respect, I believe, are implicit and obvious. So with the, with the help of the Rastafari, I have been reconsidering the question of stigma and whether it indeed need imply a denial of the past. The Rastafari did not simply refute or ignore the stigma as some scholars have theorized as the appropriate response. They went much ahead. They turned it into a very powerful weapon themselves. I want to move on because I don't um, want to, to take up too much time. I'd like to tell you this little story, actually, because this is Ambedkar's birthday, and I'm dressed appropriately for it, and I think that we should laugh a little bit more and be entertained. So I, I, I but it's related, it's not, a, it's not a random story. Actually, the story came before what I'm um, writing here. Uh, I would like to, uh, to, to kind of point out one other thing um, with regard to protest. And, and this is whether or not reggae music is protest music. And the, the answer, again, depends on how, like, like stigma, how we understand protest. If, if one were to take a moment to reflect on our own relationship with protest, what do you, what do you think about protest, about attending protest? What, is, what does protest mean? How do you receive protest? How do you participate in a protest? If you would take a moment for ref to reflect on that, you may be surprised at the worms that start to come out of the can. In <clears throat> a few random, unscientific surveys carried out by myself with habitual protesters, such words as people, justice, freedom, fear, cynicism, suspicion, music, admiration, and violence were repeated as being associated with protest. What words would you add to that list? The word that seems missing for me, my word, is actually humiliation. I would add that word to the list that's combined above. Because I think that, especially when, when one is living in a country where it seems to me that the, there's a lot of protest that happens in India, but the majority of people are protesting for very basic things. Water, education, dignity, self-respect, a, a livable wage. To actually get to that, to have to ask for something like that, I, I, it, 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 uh, it really shakes me in, at the core. I just wonder how can one bring oneself to ask for these basic rights. You know, I am a human, I'm here, I'm entitled to this. To, be, to have to ask seems to me it would carry that tinge of humiliation. And one has to do a lot to suppress that in order to, to reach out and pr to, to kind of Make, to reach that point of being able to protest. And I think that it is that suppression of that humiliation which is a dangerous thing. 
I'm not saying that the other aspects of protest aren't there, but we need to acknowledge the fact that this humiliation is there because that is what might produce that outrage or that rage that's necessary to bring about some real change. So for me, reggae as, as a musical form, as the, as the form that articulates the, res, the philosophy of the Rasta, is not protest music, it's fighting music. And this brings me to my third, this other, this f last co um, concern I have in this presentation, which is that of voice, which I referred to earlier as this question of genre. My, and this is to bring it back to what we do, what I do as a teacher. And my question here is whether our students need to be equipped with other genres of writing, other than the scholarly form, in order for them to find that voice. With its emphasis on the detached third person, its emphasis on experts and expertise, the questions, of, the questions of who can speak and who can judge are contentious and unresolved issues within academia, especially when it comes to caste. So who can speak and who can judge? I'm surprised when I read the submissions of my students at their lack, almost complete lack of interiority and awareness of the world around them. At first, I thought this was only a, lang a problem of language and I've had this discussion with my colleagues. Now I am convinced that it's also a question of genre. They haven't been able to find their voice. They're searching to find their voice. They are in a high-pitched race to become experts of the scholarly article. When they have not been exposed to genres of writing that will first and foremost enable them to find that voice. So I am here making this plea before we dismiss our students like I um, was tempted to as unobservant, grade-seeking, lazy plagiarists. They plagiarize because they don't have a voice, maybe, I'm suggesting. I would like to finish, I, 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 and I will briefly summarize my story, which is actually a play. It's not EPC is something else that we need to be dealing with. This is not, not um, anything against our, my colleagues in English. The, uh, <clears throat> yeah, Richard Chadbourne of the University of Calgary um, has been studying the question of genres across, um, across nation states and cultures, admittedly reserved only to Euro-America. He writes that the essay is marked by the peculiar relation of its author to his reader. It is the form in which the author usually speaks, to his, speaks in his own name and takes the reader into a dialogue of confidence, not necessarily in the autobiographical fashion, and often in such a way as to project a character which exists in some implied relation to his true self. The essay is a unique vehicle of thought, of the pondering of experience. Its, authors, its author stands in a distinctive relation to his subject matter, which our inter international consensus suggests might best be described as existential. Another sc scholar pinpoints this aspect especially well when he describes the work, the essays, of one of my favorite authors, James Baldwin. His particular set of essays, Notes of a Native Son. This scholar notes that Baldwin's essays, no, notes, nates, no, notes of a Native Son, as being not a piece of thought on the Negro question, but a report of what it means to be James Baldwin a report instead of getting to know the subject, be, uh, the subject of the Negro question, getting to know the subject through the author's journey to that subject. And this is something I think I would like to know from my students about their journey to these subjects. 
What really counts in the true essay is not the subject, but the subject as arrived at by the writer. As it has grown in his or her thought, as it has been done justice to by herself alone. That is what I want to say about stigma, protest, and genre. Prior to this, a, a short, and I will just take five minutes, Dennis. A short play occurred to me. I don't know how these things happen, but it occurred to me. And that is where the title Behind the Bench comes from. And yes, I think our new campus should have benches. <laughs> and I think also that maybe a symbolic but real center can be a well. A man is seated on a park bench, possibly in Lothi Garden. You can tell by looking at him that he's a lawyer, even though he's not dressed for the court. Lawyers have that way about them. <laughs> he's seated on the bench, his head is thrown back, and he's humming a tune. His eyes are closed. He has a helmet and a cycle parked next to him. He's an environmentalist of some kind, one would assume. He is humming, and another man walks, walks, is walking by, a little more loosely dressed. He stops to listen to the humming. The guy seated on the bench opens his eyes. They make eye contact. The second man compliments him on his singing and asks if he may join him on the bench. They have a very interesting conversation, conversation, the kind that you and I might look for with strangers. They realize that the day that they are sitting there is December the 3rd. And days as today, they carry multiple meanings. And through their conversation about December the 3rd, they get to know each other. They realize that December the 3rd is anti-pollution day. It is also the day of the Bhopal incident. It's also Advocates Day. It's also a few days before Ambedkar's death anniversary. It's also a few days before the destruction of the Babri Masjid. And they go on and on like this. It is also, by and coincidence, the day that, Bob, that an attempted assassination attempt was made against Bob Marley. So there are many things, and they realize they get to know each other. A certain degree of trust develops between them. It turns out as well that between the two of them, the lawyer character is possibly an upper caste young man. And the other one is a bit more ambivalent. But they are having a conversation about what do you do, what do I do, and so on and so forth. And it turns out that the first man, and I've, named, I've given them names, um, the first one's name is Avinash. I've picked them from like my student list. <laughs> the first one's name is Avinash. And he is the environmental lawyer. He, is, he actually turns out to be one. And uh, he is doing his bit for the, for the environment by cycling to and from work. As he says, it gives meaning to what I do. The other I've named uh, Vipin. And he, when asked, what do you do? He said, he reveals that he's an artist. But he's not just any kind of an artist. He's a food artist. He's a food artist. And when asked what, what gives meaning to his work, he says that what gives meaning to his work is the idea, is the philosophy that shit is the highest form of food art. He, he said that shit is the highest form of food art. Avinash had assumed earlier that he, he cooked beautiful things, that he, and he made beautiful things out of food, but no. Our artist is a different kind of artist. And like Avinash, 
his occupation is also a family occupation. It's a hereditary. It's, it's, it's been in his family in a way over time. I'm sure Avinash's father was not an environmental lawyer. So they have this conversation. And I have this, I, I, and one of the things that was going, so they have a conversation about pollution, about whether or not the law can overcome pollution, mention of Ambedkar as, a, as, as an environmental lawyer himself comes up um, in a different context. Uh, that's, so that's one conversation they have. They have another conversation about um, um, Avinash is an atheist on the inside. And Bipin is a bit surprised. He wonders if Hinduism allows for atheism on the inside. Vipin, on the other hand, is a convert, but he's, a conver he's an agnostic on the inside. And this is a, a discussion, I, I'm not sure, I haven't been able to read too much about Ambedkar on atheism, but it, something that struck me was, um, after all the critical things that Ambedkar has to say about religion in general, and not just, um, not just Hinduism, that, uh, that he converted. But he has, an, he has an argument for that, and we don't need to get into that. But what I want to get to is the end of this short play. So the, imagine it, okay? There, and, and we have to kind of use, there's a bench, they're sitting on it. Behind there's some trees, there might be a pathway. At one point, our food artist, you know, and he has a, he has a gallery in Hauskar's village where he exhibits his art. But the thing that he reveals, and this is, this is something that we have to kind of think about. People who work with whatever work they do, they know things about that work that other people don't. They know things about the materials. They know things about how to make work easier. They know a lot about it that other people don't. They're specialists. They're experts. So one of the things that our food artist knows about shit is that on the underside of it, an image is revealed. Most of us don't see the underside of our shit. He knows that. That is knowledge that has been acquired over centuries. And he has even designed a canvas. And he gets people not to sit for him, but to shit for him, okay? And this canvas has an adhesive surface. So this is a, he's a, he is a, an engaged artist. He asks out his friend, his new friend, if he would like to see what his, what the image is his own image. And because of this conversation and the trust and so on that has developed behind them, suddenly, Deepan, the bench turns and they are now behind the bench, somewhat in the trees. The image, the, 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 the image projected on the back wall is no longer the trees, right? So they get behind the trees and our friend assumes the position over the canvas. But he complains, like I'm sure most of us would, that it's not happening. He just can't do it on demand like that. The, the, the kind of setting is wrong. So Vipin says, this is precisely why I'm here. Let me help you. And he squats behind him and touches his ass. And it happens beautifully. I describe it in some detail, but I won't hear. At that moment, the police officer arrives. <laughs> and act two of this play is before a different kind of bench. <laughs> Thank you.
thing would be difficult under the best of circumstances to make all of that adhere or congeal or uh, stick together or whatever image you want to use. Um, we're all still taking this in, of course. Um, yeah, and as since, in fact, uh, it's now 7.20 by my watch, and I uh, had intended from the beginning to leave as much time as possible for questions, um, I think one thing that strikes me from all of these um, contributions is, um, you know, from various different subject positions, there's a certain kind of question which ends up being repeated or repeats itself in slightly different forms with uh, very uh, critical adjustments of prepositions and suffixes and prefixes and so on. And I think one of these questions, of course, is, um, you know, why I, what, first of all, why am I excluded? How am I excluded? What is the way of analyzing that exclusion or making some sense of it? or even deciding whether that exclusion is something that can be um, remedied. From another subject position, of course, a, a major question is, uh, why should they be included, or why should they not remain excluded? And then, in a certain way which is not necessarily perverse, another question that emerges is, does anyone really want to or need to be included? Is inclusion really what we are after? Um, and particularly from um, Anoop's uh, presentation, you know, I think I, I, I was really struck by the kind of critical weight of that question, a, a dilemma which so many of us seem to experience undoubtedly in different ways, but I think ex experience it all the same in modern societies or in the modern condition. Why should I still be so dissatisfied to have been included. If, if exclusion has been the problem, if exclusion is still the problem for so many, why are those who might feel themselves to be included in so many, by so many different reference points, nevertheless so profoundly dissatisfied? And uh, Anup used this, this phrase, uh, you know, these prefabricated, naturalized spaces which we occupy. And uh, I wonder whether how much of this is a particular uh, whatever actual problems one pinpoints, identifies in various forms of exclusion, whether civic or social, political, whatever, how, ma how many of this, how, what, f what kinds of exclusion are um, imagined or rather lived through memories of others? This is something that emerges both from, um, from Millen's presentation and also uh, Anil's, Anil's, you know, kind of playful reference to this situation that I haven't, that I'm removed from by a century or more. Uh, all of us can imagine our kind of continued presence in these very long historical and psychological processes, and it may, it, it fulfills us in certain ways to be able to engage in that. Um, and yet, it seems to me that a particular characteristic of, of modernity is to be able to imagine this process of continuity, inclusion in, in another sense, that is, to be included in a process which may be a very uh, long duration. Um, Millen, you know, talked about or mentioned some of the deficiencies of kind of standard uh, historiography or the, the tools of social science or uh, what they provided history, and uh, as, as many of you know, I mean, there, there are ways of, there are particular problems for historians of imagining the long duration or the short duration or the middle duration, and a lot of, um, a lot of historical practice, or, or rather theorizing of historical practice uh, revolves around those, those issues. Um, but I was struck also by something that uh, Sumangla had raised about um, uh, in, in, the, in the production of a certain kind of music that we often call, I think, somewhat misleadingly folk music, or actually it doesn't matter whether we call it folk music or, ma or, or mass music, it's, all, it's been very important to be able to um, engage in a kind of 
a, a process of creative empathy to construct the ordinary person or to imagine the, the subject of a particular song as being ordinary. And what does ordinary actually amount to in this, uh, this condition that we call modernity, in wh which we're all in some sense a party to and victims of? So again, just to, to wrap things up, if, there are all of these, if these questions emerge from all of these presentations about what it is to be included or excluded, what are its implications? And I think finally, this, this I think profoundly existential question, why do we need to be included? Uh, do we, is that what we really need? Is that what we really want? On what level will we allow ourselves or permit ourselves, perhaps even welcome being excluded? If, if exclusion means having some um, part of our um, individuality or individual character protected um, again, as, as Anub said, the problem is if the logic of the other becomes transformed into the logic of the same. So although this might seem very abstract, um, we have to remember that Ambedkar was interested in these problems of inclusion and exclusion, not only in a very immediate civic and political and social sense, but I think in a, in a um, more philosophical sense also in trying to determine um, what kind of path was appropriate for India and what kind of path was appropriate for, for India which was by no means psychically, psychologically, politically, philosophically the same kind of India that had been there a thousand or two or three thousand years before. Uh, Ambedkar I think was inescapably modern and therefore, I think, must have been thinking or been constantly presented or confronted with the same kinds of questions that have emerged um, from this panel discussion about you know, the various implications of inclusion and exclusion. Um, so all of these were, uh, we had a very wide-ranging um, set of presentations here. I think there are some interesting unifying themes, um, rather than my trying to bring them together or compare them, um, some of you, I think, must have questions or observations about what's been said here this evening. May I? Yes, Ashok. Uh, tough question because I'm trying to connect four of four of their thoughts and four approaches. <laughs> if I have to raise the question to myself, will you come in this time? In the system of thinking by which we consider that human mind is troubled with some primal fears, the fear of the feminine is one of the most primal, the base one. So I would have liked that if the discussion proceeds, there is a reference to where the woman appears from the title, where voices seems to be grabbed by protest far too strongly, and in the thoughts where there is an experience and there is a reference to music, where there is an experience of inclusion, which is very much the character of the woman, and in the way the shift, the lesson of the shift for me is like a baby being drawn out. So I wondered when we discuss at some point whether all the speakers would like to clarify as to where is the woman? And are we saying that Ambedkar was referring to something more primal than fear of the feminine, in which case psychoanalysis would start to gain from, from clarification that. And when I say fear of the feminine, I also need to clarify something uh, about the bench. Of the what, of the, of the something that Anup was highlighting for us. So, of not who, but what, of how woman alone for us becomes that figure uh, who can also assume the form of the bench, just the bench, you know, on, on whom we sort of find our bodies and the forms of the body. So, when we are referring to voices of protest, I'm, I'm trying to look for the body from where this. And 
my question is to Arun sir. Uh, considering that uh, the question of inclusion is the question is the question that is possible only by symbolic order. Now, uh, in that case, what is interesting, what com comes across from, uh, from your paper is where is this question happening? Is this question happening at the place of other, or is this question happening at the place of other of the other? Considering that is this question is happening at the other of the other, then your reading is all fine that you know this perverse kind of inclusion will will happen. But if this question or the demand of inclusion is happening at the other, then I would I would like to uh, reflect that Ambedkar's refuge to Buddhism is a missed opportunity. Because perhaps Buddhism in itself stands for liberation from symbolic, thus liberation from the question of other. But if we, if you, the way he refuge, uh, takes refuge in Buddhism, I think he has reasserted the question of other. He has, he has inescapably made a kind of, you know, a, I mean, isn't it possible to think structurally, as Dr. Menon was pointing out, that we are given a position of protestant or of the other by structure itself. So aren't we reasserting when we take this position, the question of other, the demand for other? So isn't this a missed opportunity by not having to relegate upon the principles of Buddhism, but upon the stance of Buddhism, or modifying the principle of Buddhism to the political stance? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I think uh, partly also my question is a kind of answer to the previous question. That in fact, when Ambedkar, uh, 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 you know, uh, decided on Buddhism, it was it was not the Buddhism. And in fact, we had uh, talked about that. But my my uh, my question is also to to both Milin and Anup, the way. Uh, Ambedkar's thoughts and ideas are interpreted nowadays. In in, in Berlin, it was Gopal Guru's crack mirror, where where you know there is a contradiction in Gopal Guru's entire writing itself. Where, where you know, if you look at most of the book, uh, writings of Gopal Guru, you will find that this particular book, before that also humiliation, is a is a kind of a um, uh, what epistemological term in in the way. Gopal Guru thinks about uh, you know emancipation itself, and I, I would I would rather talk I, I would rather name it as a postmodernist term. And somewhere uh, the way uh, Anup is talking about Ambedkar uh, is also a kind of Foucauldian Freudian more of than a Marxist way of understanding Ambedkar. You know? And somewhere in in both Milin and uh, uh, Anup, what I find is a and, and it may be a naive kind of finding, as, as, but what I find is a is a essentialization of Ambedkar itself. In, in Gopal Guru's uh, understanding of experience, there is this construction of experience from the other, construed from the other. Whereas when I was reading Crack Mirror, I was also reading at the same time another very interesting uh, uh, novel, and it's, it's one of the very few. Uh, novels that is written in Dalit writing that is called Untouchable Spring by Kalyan Rao, very less known writer, and uh, the soul work, uh, the whole uh, uh, idea of soul work in, in Untouchable Spring is a work of uh, which constructs from within the self and then goes out. You know, it's a kind of inside out and outside in uh, kind of experience, which is uh, so this. So uh, I would rather uh, you know, uh, look at Gopal Guru's idea of experience as more of a kind of distorted postmodernist <laughs> relegation to experience than than Kalyanov's thing. And at the same time, Anup, uh, uh, why I brought Marxist and the understanding of understanding Ambedkar here is that somewhere we, by by looking at Ambedkar, and when I, you were talking about Ambedkar, I, I was reminded of uh, Dr. Nagras, you know, in his in his beautiful book, when he starts with. Uh, the introduction, he talks about the, the uh, indispensability of Gandhi and Ambedkar. That uh, it, cannot, it could not have been imagined, it could not have been possible uh, of Ambedkar without Gandhi and Gandhi without uh, Somewhere I was reminded of that because somewhere at the end of, the, uh, of your talk, you were 
you almost made Ambedkar Gandhi. That that it was Ambedkar who was, as as far as we know, as yet we knew that who is a modernist, who is a staunch rationalist, who believed in the idea ideal ideals of uh, modern uh, and progressive change with education, with education. Uh, but here you gave us a picture which is completely different. So I would I would probably like you to reflect on that a little bit. Thank you. This is a question to possibly all the panelists. Uh, and possibly, not, I'm not even expecting an answer for that. Mm, because I, I believe it would be too difficult to answer it. Uh, <laughs> Three days ago, I think we had this uh, documentary screening uh, and a few of our faculty were there. Uh, it was by Ajay Bharatwaj and it was quite a befitting and it was organized by Purim by students, by the way, and so less faculty members were there. But the question which the film actually, I mean, uh, the question which came to my mind by listening to all of you and reflecting in the context of that film is what happens to a Ambedkar or what is the residue of uh, residue which emanates from Ambedkar's thought. And there are a few things which are very interestingly happening in the film uh, in the contours of what are the things in Punjab and how do they experience themselves. And what we interestingly found, uh, there, were, there were all kinds of characters. Uh, Al Singh Dil, who, who who draws his inspiration from the left and has been a part of the nationalite movement, occupies a very important central uh, theme within the film, but he's also somebody who often, while the camera is rolling, would go and offer a namaz. So from being a Dalit, from being who draws inspiration from Ambedkar, to being a communist, and offering the mass. Then there were examples of Dalits who had deep veneration for certain Chishti Sabri traditions, which is very popular in Punjab. And women who are the machines to, or successors to make friends within the contour of an extremely violent and extremely oppressive Jat, dominant Jat landscape, rural landscape. And there were instances of uh, poetry, beautiful poetry, uh, from very uh, Ambedkarite kind of uh, writers, who, who somewhere expressed a sense of ambivalence to what would, as uh, Anu just said, what would the modern, what modernity within the Ambedkar do with all these kinds of practices in imagination of their own self. So I'm really intrigued by these examples and their interrelationship of what would be the residue of uh, residue of Ambedkar's thought in the lives of uh, uh, Dalits today. And also a very beautiful uh, comment which Dal Singh Dil made one uh, in, in the film itself about how what happens to the constitution. You know? uh, there is there is this person who really is conversing with and uh, the person said, oh, Ambedkar wrote the constitution, come on. And then he said, Ambedkar also, uh, and, and the response which comes from Lal Singh did was, Valmiki also wrote Ramayana. And when it becomes Ramayana, Valmiki self is nowhere. And so I understand thinking of what will happen to Ambedkar thought and then post-constitution, how would you then imagine a life? Uh, why don't we allow uh, the panelists to respond to that first round of questions first, and then if need be, we'll have a second round? Because I think we're having... It may be difficult to take on a whole bunch of questions at once. Uh, I have one question before we like, wind up. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to frame it in the 
for any exclusion that happens, uh, but I think because our dinner is waiting, uh, again, I would invite the panelists to respond to anything that's been said or asked. <laughs> Baker's insistence that um, that ma intermarriage um, was necessary for um, for caste annihilation, uh, and in that way, again, he was kind of um, positing the woman, the woman's body, the family, and so on. And the way that this turned out, this kind of uh, you know uh, homosocial moment, to put it that way. Is the way that challenges um, or, or takes takes what Baker was saying in a different direction, kind of takes it further. <coughs> I also um, um, believe that the judge in Act Two would be a woman. Mm -hmm. Happens in the Woman. Difficult to respond to this question. Uh, uh, I would think there is no one place for them. So uh, there would be no one primal fear. There would be uh, fears hyphenated, connected in a kind of horizontality, perhaps. 
and perhaps uh, it would not be again fear of the who. It could be the way Anil was uh, trying to put it. It could be fear of the what, the adjective, the shit. So in that sense, uh, it would be interesting to imagine, as you are suggesting, psychoanalysis with primal fears of who and psychoanalysis with primal fears of what and shit, uh, which requires uh, the institution of the law, the paradoxical institution of the law when the bench turns, as I have beautifully put it actually. It's very evocative, I'm, I'm really moved uh, 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 because it's making me think uh, that uh, it's, it's well possible that uh, Indian psychoanalysis will theorize fear of the what as against the fear of the who. It's it's very possible. That's that's one. Um, Ambedkar missed opportunity. Other other of the other. I don't want to get into uh, too much of technical discussion. More simply, it would again be uh, the six weeks, and 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 I was really wondering when I was reading when did really it converge? And it really really went on from 1926, 1930, 1931. I thought, oh, it's going to happen now. And then I see it's 1950s, and then it's nearly 55 when it's about to happen, and and. Uh, it also shows uh, the the uh, deferred nature of the voice of protest, the deferred nature of voice, perhaps that uh, voice doesn't come too soon, and it is always it always comes like a missed opportunity. Oh, oh the scream that went unheard, that that was not perhaps spelled out. And, and in that sense, that 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 keeps the tragic alive in a tragic sense, actually. That that Ambedkar becomes legal, modern constitutionalism, as Yogesh was also pointing out. And 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 uh, that 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 is something we have to ponder upon. And and uh, and, and uh, I always thought India's history was made when um, Godse shot at Gandhi, when a Hindu killed a Hindu. Uh, but it now appears India's history was also made uh, in those six weeks. And, and it's well possible that we will have to ponder upon uh, our future in terms of these two parts or, or other, uh, you know, other parts unknown to us, perhaps, so, uh, or unacknowledged. In other words. So, in that sense, essentializing experience, old work, I let Milind answer. But, but uh, my my only only uh, you know very very careful contention would be I'm not so scared of essentialism anymore. I was when I was younger. Uh, so. Uh, It is, it is worth pondering upon, and this is a serious point now, uh, how, when, and why critics of essentialism arrived on our shows, just like in future discussion. In that sense, it is worth pondering upon this question. Uh, uh, what, uh, like, uh, including critics of Cultural essentialism. Uh, what does it do to voice? Uh, is, a, is a question worth pondering upon. So I'm not answering it, but I'm only rendering the question questionable. It's 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 worth examining. Uh, uh, what is natural about critics of essentialism? Just like how natural it was to be essential. Once upon a time, is it? And now it is not to be essentially. 
in that sense it's a question what what quantity you know making ambedkar gandhi yes this is this is this is where i'm i'm increasingly reaching is that the again the sharp distinction between gandhi and ambedkar that we have generated again for ourselves is what uh, revisit and 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 uh, 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 the the sharp distinction between modern pre modern anti modern or uh, hyper modern anti modern and 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 in these kinds of again essential postures uh, that have that have become our bread and butter uh, uh, and have become the uh, logic the idiom uh, the paradigmatic framework perhaps for much of social science uh, theorizing perhaps needs to be really and that will affect pedagogies that will affect research it it may it may uh, attend to ourselves uh, in different ways and, and uh, uh. yeah one thing i i you know forgot in between you know and i was talking about your related to sicolian freudian i also thought that to add it to post dissection level in a, in a way yeah. you may you may put it that way you may put it that way or, or see the order of things in social sciences in general not disciplines only uh, 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 the the last is uh, 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 the way anil had put it i think uh, let us not take too seriously or with too much or theories incumbent upon us and the and the and the as is a good metaphor uh, to to uh, you know uh, not get too enamored by uh, either uh, liberal principles or religious principles and and and, uh, and take them as as less serious in a way so yogesh in a way it would be uh, like my attempt to be would be to to make things a little less serious uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, be in or and in in that sense uh, uh, ankit your your question uh, remains alive uh, uh, the what and the how uh, and the and the attempt has been to move from the who uh, to the what and the how and uh, maybe we will have to uh, collectively work towards it and it's a long long haul it's not going to happen in a flash uh, so uh, and and where professor menon ended i think uh, which was interesting when you said ki uh, this university is going to stay uh, and and this institution is like a plant maybe a seedling not even a plant and and it's going to grow uh, so in that sense uh, i think it's a long haul but my only point only submission to all of us would be it is a collaborative long haul uh, positions around exclusion only will not help us uh um peace at inclusion only will not help us so in that sense uh yeah. yeah ashok uh, i think i would like to take up your question of the fear of the feminine although i'm not equipped disciplinarily or you know conceptually to actually talk about it in ways in which you know you would have posed the question but i'd like to really give a couple of examples but these are not examples from what i've been talking about um i'm just using these examples as perhaps examples that would you know reveal the kinds of processes that become inherent two discussions on culture and politics and the two examples that i'd like to give are from um uh, early 20th century greece and algeria um and uh, not early 20th century sometime in the 1950s um the general secretary or the secretary of something known as the pan hellenic psychiatrist association actually gave a public statement uh, which said that greeks 
are inherently, inherently depressed people uh, because they listen to too much sad music and this is sad music that originates from Turkey. And so this is in the period, you know, this is the, at the end of a series of developments that are happening through the definition of Greek identity as well as Turkish identity post uh, Ataturk and so on. And um, Kazantzakis was caught in this controversy, being Greek himself, but being sympathetic or you know, politically not wanting to define himself in terms of a Hellenic identity. And his response was to say that, um, you know, the Orient is my mother. And uh, so this is an interesting debate that took place at that time, and I think that points out to several questions about wh what causes threats when it comes to something like music. The fact that a set of minor notes, or what we call the Bhairav Thaat in our tradition, um, could pose such a threat to European civilization and to, for somebody to actually defend it, to say, that's my mother's tradition, I think puts a lot of these you know, questions uh, up front. The other example that I'd like to give is um, from Algeria. Um, again, um, the, 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 the music genre, which is known as Rai today, which is you know, very, very well known, especially through the singer Khalid, um, but was it was a, a form that originated um, in the early 20th century in Algeria, essentially as peasant women's rebel music, and that was something that was uh, harnessed quite actively by the Algerian Revolution, the National Movement, and so on. Uh, so these so-called body songs that were sung by peasant women, um, which were managing to mobilize people across the countryside, where used quite effectively by the national movement, and the moment they got independence, it was banned. Um, and then there's a whole series, the story of Rai is a very, very interesting uh, 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 story. Uh, of if It gets banned three or four times, and eventually um, becomes legitimized, and you know, Khalid becomes, is crowned as the king of uh, Rai, um, only after the, the, the Algerian population in France, takes it up as a, uh, um, as, as a major, major musical idiom, it goes to Hollywood, and so on and so forth. So there are these, you know, the silencing of the feminine, its relationship to protest, um, uh, and so on. There are enough examples, and so I don't know whether this, this addresses your question in any way. But that brings me to um, um, the next part, which is, I mean, Yogesh, I would really like to attempt to say, you know, respond to some of your questions, not, not as answers, but um, I think uh, what, I mean, I would personally like to look at the potential of radical culture as something that is non-essentializing. And I think that's, that seems to be you know, true about more and more evidence that is coming in, which actually looks self-reflexively at, at material. So, um, and, it's something that is constantly changing, and therefore, you know, multiple identities that people have, uh, uh, you know, the fact that as individuals we all reflect you know, different fragments of experience, even if one might be talking about, you know, particular identities asserting themselves at particular points of time, I think we've gone beyond uh, times when we would expect a radical. Uh, you know, intellectual to be only of a particular type, and uh, so and I, and I think, especially in India, uh, after the Sufi revival, uh, after you know, we've all gone back in some sense to the past to look for syncretic traditions in the context of conflict and things like that. I think it's that non-essentialization uh, which would be the base uh, basis of what I would like to call protest. Which is not to say that I don't believe in class identities or, you know, uh, um, um, or, or in horizontal solidarities that go beyond, you know, fragments of experience, so to say, but, uh, but to say that, you know, it's not such a contradictory thing to see people 
living multiple lives, and I think that's true about all of us. And I'll just quickly respond to that. Obviously, it should be a part of a longer conversation. But uh, I mean, I think it's uh, uh, there's no harm in uh, historicizing uh, Gopal Guru and Sarukai and the kind of work they're doing because it is uh, it is uh, it comes to us at a at a, at a, at a certain point. Uh, it, it 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 wants to reflect. Uh, on something, and so therefore, uh, I would say that uh, even if it is uh, postmodern and so on and so forth, what it is trying to do is something important. And, I, and what is important there is, in fact, uh, couched in something that you said that it is really uh, trying to think of a different kind of soul work as opposed to thinking from the inside out, because you do have very strong exam examples of that in the work of people, in the thought of people like Aurobindo, people like. Uh, Gandhi, Turk, and so on. In fact, I'm, I'm referring to the, um, <coughs> the traditional modern karma work. What uh, then would happen if the soul work were to emerge from a point of exteriority? And I think that is an insight which, and if that is an ambivalence, it is a it is a productive ambivalence. If that if uh, theory has uh, ruined everything, I think it's an enabling violence. Uh, so in that sense, I, I, I think there's much to be said for the kind of labor of thought that is going into that. Uh, into, into